What if I told you that there's a way to become more connected to your coworkers, to the work that you do, a way to feel more engaged, more satisfied, more situationally aware? And what if I told you that you're doing many of those things already? And maybe you could just use a little something, that rug that brings the whole room together. It's time to abide. It's time to talk about the debrief. You make tough calls when caring for acutely ill and injured children. Join us for strategy and support through clinical cases, research, and reviews, and best practice guidance in our ever-changing acute care landscape. This is your Pediatric Emergency Playbook. Welcome to the Playbook. I'm your host and coach, Tim Horechko. Medicine is not science. Medicine is not art. It's both. Medicine is the special amalgam forged in you, the human being connecting to another human being, using the right tools for the right job. Sometimes patients need more of our scientific skills to sort through the data, to understand the presenting pathology. Sometimes patients need us just to be us, a caring person to be present with them while they're going through whatever it is they're suffering from. Most times we just need to figure out what part of ourselves the patient needs the most. But we don't live or work in a vacuum. It takes a team to keep everyone sharp and whole and sane. Every day in the emergency department, we see so much pain and suffering. We need to understand that the routine that we allow or just let happen is what becomes our culture at work. Even the best place to work can and should always be looking to improve. We have some tools that can enrich our culture, even make the care of our patients better. It's taking a moment to brief, to huddle, to debrief. Whatever you want to call it, whatever terminology you use, it's just watching out for yourself, for your team, for your patients. It's what you already do in various ways, but today I'd like to talk about some specific tools that we can all use right now, today, in your next shift to enrich our work culture, to make us better prepared to care for our patients. We can do this through learning conversations, intentional conversations, before, during, and after a challenging case or an event. In the literature, this is often called the hot debrief. It promotes a shared mental model. It promotes learning. It acknowledges the importance of work as done. That is, all of the textbooks and all of the reference apps in the world will do you no good when the rubber hits the road and you have a disconnected, disenfranchised, disinterested, and disengaged workforce or patients. Now, let's not jump into just the feelings of all this. Let's go over the evidence for debriefing. Twig et al. in 2020 found that across the board, medical staff valued debriefing and that there was a strong desire to use it. Rose et al. published in a Cochrane review called Psychological Debriefing for Preventing Post-Traumatic Stress Disorder. They concluded that using medical debriefing was psychologically safe for those who participated. Another pro here is that debriefings have been shown to be effective if led by senior nurses using a template. To be fair, there is some literature describing the cons of debriefing. Ariag et al. published Real-Time Debriefing After Critical Events, Exploring the Gap Between Principle and Reality. The authors report that Debriefing in reality is infrequent. Also, of course, it takes time out of other clinical activities, and there is what they called a production pressure that discourages it. We feel that every day in the ED, the pressure to be productive. My take on this is that, like any tool, you just have to choose when it's best used and will have 
the most impact. The brief is the quick check in and organizational phase. When we come up with a prelim plan together for what we're about to do. The huddle is the in the moment check in. Are we going in the right direction? The debrief happens after all is said and done and how we learn from what just happened. Let's reenact a case and pause as needed using these techniques. You get a radio call that medics are bringing in a six month old, not breathing CPR in progress. You took the call. They couldn't say more. They were on their way five minutes out. The call was short and tense. You assemble your team. Okay, everybody, trauma base six. We're all here. Let's quickly go around the room. Names and roles. We go around with our names. Who's getting the IV? Who's getting the meds? Who's the recorder? Who's assigned to airway? All of the likely tasks that will be needed. When there is clarity, there is calm. I give a quick brief. All right, everybody. Medics called in for a six-month-old, found not breathing by his mom. All we know is that CPR is in progress. You take out the Braslow tape. Usually they tell us what color on the tape the child is, but this is going to be a scoop and run. Let's just do our best to approximate. Okay, everybody, six month old is about eight kilos. So let's go red, eight kilos. Everyone gets busy with their own preparations and so do you. Okay, so that's red on the Braslow for a six month old. I'll need the infant bag valve mask, Miller Blade 1, size three cuffed ET tube. My backup is an LMA 1.5. Everyone okay? Anyone need anything? Luckily, we're ready because no sooner do you say that that the medics roll in. You see one medic pushing the stretcher with one hand, blow by in the other. The other medic is doing compressions and trying not to trip as they rush into the resuscitation room. You hear a quick report and they bring the child over. Not much more on the history other than the mother found the child this way and there's another relative on the way. The baby girl in front of you is cold, pale, lifeless. She's very small. I quickly ditch the infant mask and replace it with a neonatal mask and start bag ventilation, being very careful to bring her little face into the mask, gently applying pressure on the thin ridge of the jaw into the plastic cushion, not over her soft tissues. Hey everybody, she looks small. How old is she? One medic says, not sure. Another speaks up. Mom said two months. Aha, uh -huh, that makes more sense. One of the nurses takes the red arrow to the crown, remember red to head, and to the heel to the colors on the Braslow tape. The baby is a very small two month old, actually gray on the Braslow, maybe four kilograms. You thank the medics, and as they fade into the background, they watch. Another doctor gets an IO needle in her proximal right tibia. You think, okay, my equipment may need some adjusting. Miller 1 is still okay. ET2 likely okay at 3. Cuffed LMA would need a size down. Okay, got it. Something's changed. Time to huddle. Okay, pause. We have a common scenario in which the medics try to get as much as they can, but really this was a scoop and run. They were running and playing chess at the same time. That's all fine. We expect adjustments on arrival. You can quickly figure things out for yourself, but the team needs to know what you're thinking. We need a new working metal mental model. We need a shared mental model. We have to re huddle mostly for the medications. We had drawn up our epinephrine for an eight kilogram child. In fact, all of our calculations were scribbled on our whiteboard here for an eight kilogram child, the non depolarizing agent, the sedation, even some of the antiarrhythmics. Now that may be all clear to you and you catch it quickly, but in stressful situations, everyone can get tunnel vision and focus only on what he or she is doing individually right now. We need to pause. We need to declare a huddle, declare a new context, a new situation. We need to reshare our new mental model. And by the way, a calm tone goes a long way. Calm is clear. Clear is calm. Here we go. 
All right, everyone, you say as you continue to bag, the resident physician is doing an expert job in the two-handed encircling technique of cardiac massage. All right, we now have a four kilogram infant gray on the Braslow. We need to update our medication doses. We have an IO. Four kilograms times, uh, somebody please do the math for me. The astute nurse quickly adjusts the dose. Four kilograms times 0 0.01 mg per kg, and that is 0 0.04 milligrams. Given. You intubate with CPR in progress. You stabilize the tube. Hand over the bagging. Meds are in. Warm fluids are in. The presenting rhythm, or at least what you captured on arrival, was PEA. You quickly put in the ultrasound probe on the next rhythm check, pulse check. You see no activity on transthoracic echo. You resume CPR. Another 0 0.04 milligrams of epinephrine. You now have an IV in now, so that goes through that. You do a head-to-toe exam with CPR in progress. A thin strip of dark modeling on the torso, the buttocks, and even the thighs starts to appear, or maybe you just hadn't noticed it initially. And you clock that as levito reticularis. It may have not been so obvious on arrival, but now that you're trying to get some circulation going, it's now showing up more obviously. This child has been dead for some time. Things are starting to come together. You need a new huddle. With every new major development, you need to keep your team on the same page. The nurses are great about calling out IV in, epi in, time for pulse check. Time for you to bring them in to what you're thinking now. The objectives for the huddle are to declare, to summarize, and to ask. You declare a new finding. You summarize what this means altogether. You ask for info that you may not be aware of. Declare. Everyone, I see signs of blood pooling. That means that this child has been down for some time. Summarize. I like to say, Let's summarize. We have a two-month-old unknown downtime with an initial non-shockable rhythm who continues to have a non-shockable rhythm throughout the resuscitation. Ask, how long have we been working on her? What's the end tidal CO2? Did we get a glucose? Basically, now is the time to gather whatever info that may be available. This also empowers the staff to speak up. Wait, wait, wait. The pH point of care is just about to result. Let's find out what that is. Or, wait, wait, wait. The end tidal CO2 after 20 minutes is 15. Ask. Crowdsource your understanding of the situation. Okay, everyone. It's time to make a decision here. Does anyone know where the parents are? The nurse quickly checks. They are in total grief right outside the room. Keep doing what you're doing. I'll talk to mom and dad and see if they want to be here with them towards the end. You briefly talk with mom and dad. Dad is quiet, looking at the corner. You can tell he hears you. He just can't look at you. Mother can barely see you through her twisted face and overflowing eyes. You find out her name is Lily. We've done everything possible for Lily. We need to see if her body is accepting what we're doing. We will stop pushing on her chest to see if she's with us or not. Would you like to be there for this? Mother understands what you're saying. Father hesitates, but they go hand in hand. You introduce the parents. This is Lily's mother and father. You get two chairs to put behind them as they stand by the bedside. Pause compressions. No pulse. Rhythm, no activity. Mom and Dad, we've done everything possible. Lily has died. A wave of cold stillness over everyone. You glance up at the clock, make a note, say nothing. Everyone, let's take a moment for Lily and what she means to her mother and father and family. Thank you, everyone. You stand with mom and dad. You say nothing. This is not your time. This is theirs. Mother starts to ask random questions. You answer simply. Again, you use your presence to connect with them, not your words. 
After some time, you tell them, this time is for you. I will come later to check on you. I'm right here. You walk out and see the long gray faces of everyone. Now what? Move on, back to work, see the 10 new people who always seem to check in whenever there's a code? The parents are tended to for now. Their road will be slow and painful. Luckily, we have a social worker to help them through inevitable practicalities. You'll check on them soon. You want to give them some space and some time. But what do you need? What does your team need? There's the production pressure. There's this weird feeling of, who am I to be the Kumbaya camp counselor? You get over it because you remember what we all need. We need connection. We need support. We need clarity. We need to take care of ourselves and each other. And we need to go along, along this journey together and not fall apart. We briefed to be ready. We huddled to adapt. We need to debrief to overcome. There are various tools and templates to use for the hot debrief. The learning conversation done as close to the event as possible. This was such an event that you invite everyone over to a corner of the ED to talk somewhere that you won't be readily disrupted. The STOP5 is a hot debrief model developed by our colleagues in Scotland for just such a case. We stop for five minutes. S. Summarize the case. T. Things that went well. O. Opportunities to improve. And P. Points of action. I won't reenact this. It will be different for different groups, settings, and cultures. The main thing is to get everyone clear about what actually happened. S. Summarize. T. Things that went well. Whether that was being ready or improvising or communication or whatever, start with the things that went well. O. Opportunities to improve. It's best to talk about processes, not people. So, I noticed that redosing the epinephrine was a little difficult because we ran out of the small syringes in the drawer. That brings us to P, points of action. What's our stocking process? How can we make sure that we're always stocked with every size syringe? Stop for five. Thank you, Edinburgh. Another tool that you can use is from an international team from the UK, Spain, and Norway called TALK, T-A-L-K, TALK a tool for structured debriefing. It uses, you guessed it, talk as a mnemonic. Target, analysis, learning point, and key actions. Very similar to the stop for five. T for target. What should we focus on? A, analysis. What happened and why? L, learning point. What do we take away from this? And K, key actions. What will we do about it? You can choose to use stop five, talk, team steps, or whatever structured debriefing tool you use in your institution or you feel comfortable with. The point is that these paradigms can take the cognitive load off of you while you're trying to help yourself and others through that aftermath. The debrief can really build our clinical skills and help us connect with each other. We miss a great opportunity if we don't take action on the actionable things like supplies, like processes, like staffing. We don't want to be in the same situation again and find ourselves lacking, especially if we can improve. So this may be you as the facilitator who makes a note of the suggestions and ideas and takes the next step. Often that means having a good conversation with an administrator or coming to someone with a meaningful story, a problem, and a solution, it's motivating for change. If this is all that we take away from our time together today, I am very happy. But 
I know you. You want a little more. You want a little educational theory, but in a nice, tasty, bite-sized nugget. Okay, here we go. The first tenet has been known for decades. In educational circles, the goal of being the guide on the side rather than the sage on the stage. I say this is good advice in any kind of learning environment, but it's crucial in a debriefing. Everyone comes to the debrief with his or her own skill set, knowledge, experience, what have you. If you're facilitating the debrief, you're not there to lecture to anyone. You're not there to, you're not there to tell them what you think or what your perception is. You're there to crowdsource and highlight the knowledge, the experience, the ideas of the whole room. So that is a baseline, a collaborative effort. Let's go through some hardcore educational theory in digestible bites. David Kolb is a psychologist and educational theorist who described the experiential learning theory, that is, learning from experience. You understand what you experience and you make it into a transformative spark. As Kolb would say, knowledge is created through the transformation of experience. This really goes hand in hand with how medical education happens. To translate this into Kolb cycle, it would start with a concrete experience, reflective observation, abstract conceptualization, and active experimentation. In other words, feeling, watching, thinking, and doing. The experiential learning process starts with a specific concrete experience, in this case, the infant in full arrest. Then there is a reflective observation. I step back and I think, what happened? What did I do? How did I do? How does this compare to what I've been through before and how I've performed before? Then there is abstract conceptualization. We let our guards down. And we think of things not as me, but as a better me. At this stage, we generate abstract principles that we can apply to future situations. This is the stage when we make new rules for ourselves. So every time I see an EKG, I look for an old one in comparison. That's a rule. Or from now on, I will re-verify the Broslow, Broslow tape myself. That's another rule. Once we've taken what we can from the experience, we can do active experimentation with that new rule, that new knowledge, that new skill, that new understanding. We apply these new ideas to our work. We test out the new rules we have for ourselves and adjust them as needed. Concrete experience, reflective observation, abstract conceptualization, active experimentation, and that cycles back to a new concrete experience, then observation, conceptualization, experimentation, that loops us back to concrete experience, reflective observation, active experimentation. Donald Shun was one of the early architects of cognitive design theory. His work in reflective practice boils down the concept to an even more user-friendly paradigm. There is reflection in action and reflection on action. This gets us even closer to the work as done, how the brief huddle and debrief is done. Reflection in action is recognition in real time of the new thing, that new thing that may be the key to diagnosis. The question that if we just asked would explain the patient's presentation or realizing that this infant looks too small to be a six month old, a reflection in action that prompted you to redo the, Bro the Broslow measurement, which changed everything. Reflection in action would include the brief and the prep stage. Are we ready? As we huddle, where are we now? Reflection on action is the retrospective opportunity to learn to improve when all the dust settles and you have a moment to yourself. Reflection on action is the debrief and all the individual and group processes 
and learning that comes after. The last bit of educational theory that I want to review with you, by the way, isn't this fascinating? We can use this every day in situations that we have in our everyday lives. I think having that extra construct in our minds will help us in our learning process and to understand that everyone has his or her own process and to respect that. So lastly, we have Erickson's deliberate practice. Deliberate practice involves repetitive performance of intended cognitive or psychomotor skills in a focused domain, coupled with rigorous skills assessment and feedback. K. Anders Ericsson was a Swedish psychologist who specialized in the nature of expertise and human performance. He argued that expert performers were not born, they were made by a persistent, deliberate effort. Erickson held that practice makes permanent and only deliberate practice makes perfect. That is, you can do the same thing over and over for years, but if you're doing it wrong, you're not learning and you can't really excel or be an expert. Constantly, carefully engaging with what you're doing, trying to improve, is deliberate practice, and that is what makes us an expert. We're all guilty of getting into a rut. This is just a friendly reminder to all of us, myself included, that deliberate practice is the only way to improve. One thing to note about Erickson's theory is that different tasks need different amounts of deliberate practice to become an expert. The 10,000 hour rule is actually a miscalculation from what Erickson originally wrote. 10,000 hours has a nice ring to it, but it's totally made up. You may need twice that to become a competitive pianist, or a quarter of that time to learn basic EKGs, or a triple that to learn, in my case, the electronic medical record. In this baby's case, you could apply this deliberate practice to thinking through your age and weight-based formulas for endotracheal tube uh, size or laryngoscope size or medication dosing or when is the best time to huddle in the middle of a difficult case. The point is, practice makes permanent, but deliberate practice makes perfect or closer and closer to perfect, to be more exact. Whatever brief, huddle, debrief, template you use, stop five, talk, or something else, whatever learning theory helps you, Kolb's experiential cycle, or Shun's reflective in the moment, or after the moment, or Erickson's deliberate practice, use what makes sense to you and what helps keep you going, keep trying, and keep sharing what you learn with others. So now you're ready to brief, huddle, and debrief. Let's go over some pearls and lessons learned over the years to help solidify these concepts. Don't go it alone. If you want to be an agent of change, you can't do it by yourself or suddenly foist it on people. Start simply. Start doing it for yourself. Start talking to people and see if they have any interest in it. Even if you're met with a little resistance or get blown off, planting the seeds and seeing if they take may be the first step to getting others on board with a culture of debriefing. Don't go it alone. Right time, right place. If this is a mass casualty incident, you need to focus on getting the department under control and in a safe working condition. If the staff is all there past their time and they, are they really going to be ready to talk about some heavy stuff? Also, think ahead of where you would want to debrief when you do. In these charged times, 
you may not realize the effect that this is all having on you as well. And you want to plan ahead. Just make it a little easier for yourself. Plan ahead and designate a spot ahead of time. It helps make this process easier. Maybe there's a relatively quiet corner. Maybe there's a small room with a door that can close. Somewhere conducive to relatively uninterrupted five minutes or so. The right time, the right place. Invite. Don't require. When you're building up this culture of feedback or debriefing, there will be some skeptics or people who just do not want to participate. And that is just fine. Remember, we talked about how everyone learns in his or her own way. When you make this a welcoming, nurturing choice, it feels supportive to those who choose to be there. And you may just get some of those looky-loos on the side who choose to participate next time. The people who are there had better want to be there. They better be there for the right reasons and they will want to participate. There's just not going to be any quality, any point in doing it if you force people. There's no such thing as a forced learning discussion. Invite don't require. Acknowledge what just happened. We just lost a beautiful new life. The parents, grandparents, siblings, everyone, no one will be the same again. Even us. We may not remember every patient we see, or sadly, even every patient who dies if we do this long enough. But each loss makes a mark. Whether that mark has a face or a name, it affects us. It's okay not to be okay. It's okay to acknowledge that. You may see yourself as the stalwart leader who is keeping it together for the benefit of the team. Someone else may see that as a cold, unfeeling, detached person. My point is not to scan the room and overreact to others' perceptions. My point is that it is perfectly fine for you as facilitator to be affected to share how you feel. Acknowledging the suffering helps to show others that it is okay not to be okay. Know when. Not everything needs a debrief. Read the room. Get to know your colleagues and coworkers. What may affect you may not have much of an effect on other people and vice versa. In this case, a debriefing is a really good idea, even if everyone feels okay about how things went. It keeps the spirit alive and gives others a chance to practice that skill. But try to figure out what really is the best value added. What's the highest yield situation? If you notice that someone's perturbed by it, annoyed, worried, or you feel a sense of uncertainty, remember, where there is clarity, there is calm. If there is no calm, that might be a good choice. Speaking of which, it doesn't have to be something tragic, a difficult patient encounter, or maybe an abusive parent or visitor, or an uncomfortable diagnosis. Any of these things may need a check-in with others. We are privileged to see the raw side of the human experience. Some things don't shock us, but that doesn't mean that they don't affect us. Know when. Facilitate, don't dominate. It's easy to go into teaching mode, especially when you're just trying to create a new culture of debriefing. People might look to you for direction. Think of a favorite interviewer that you have. This person likely knows a lot about the subject. When he or she interviews someone, they've done their research. They probably know a lot of the answers to the questions before they even ask. A well-prepared interviewer can probably answer 75% of his own questions, at least on the level that's asked. The mark of a great interviewer is getting the other person to shine. The previous knowledge helps to facilitate the right question asked. Use your knowledge and experience to get others to share their knowledge and experience. It's amazing what you can pull out of others if you just open the door. Facilitate, don't dominate. Focus. 
focus on one thing that's helpful. You could spend hours dissecting everything. Try to use your cloud as the facilitator to focus on one or two things the team could benefit from and leave it at that. Addition by subtraction. Focus. Avoid individual assessments. It's easy to choose the one thing that went wrong and the one person who did it. What's wrong with this statement? First, we should focus on the positive. Everyone is already his or her own worst critic, and we have to assume that everyone is smart, hardworking, and doing the best that they can. Second, these are opportunities to improve. I know this sounds a lot like sugarcoating, but remember to be careful with people who are vulnerable and who choose to be vulnerable with you. Be extra careful. Be more careful than you think you should be. Talk about processes. Talk about safeguarding. Talk about troubleshooting for next time, because that next time it could be you on the firing squad. Avoid individual assessments. Use a recognizable structure. Remember that you may be the only one in the room that gets really excited about this. It may be so exciting to you to use these tools to bring the team together, but if you're always trying new things and experimenting, people don't know what to expect. Everyone else may just be trying to get through the day to day. If you use a tool that people start to recognize, it helps them to feel more involved. They know what to expect. In fact, they may go into the debriefing already with some ideas because they have this cognitive paradigm preloaded. You've helped them. You've given them some kind of structure by using the same template, the same user-friendly, workable temp template that works for all of you. Maybe you choose stop for five and you stick with it. Every time you use that tool, you reinforce the process for everyone. Once people know what to expect, what the group will talk about, it encourages those to participate and to speak up. Use a recognizable structure. And finally, as the old saying goes, culture eats strategy for breakfast. You can have all the fancy tools you want and the coolest of spaces to discuss them in, but if you don't have buy-in, if it's not part of the culture, the techniques, the strategies just won't take. This is a slow process of discovery for the individual and for the group. Be patient, be persistent, be supportive, even deliberate. Thank you for listening. Until next time, remember, you are the champion for the child in front of you. Take care. Thank you for listening to The Playbook. We welcome your comments, questions, and feedback. Email Tim at coach at PEMplaybook.org or drop by our website for show notes and more strategy at PEMplaybook.org. See you there.